something a little different here today. Come and listen. Holy ground, here 
seated. Well, good morning and welcome to a nice, cool room here after uh, sweltering through the past week. Wow, it is good to be a little bit cool and maybe even chilly here, but that's all right. We'll take it this morning, right? So I am glad that you're here. If you're a guest, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate your being here too. There is a QR code that's in the bulletin. There's a card that's in the seat back in front of you. If you'd like to get more information about Waterford Community Church, we'd love to tell you. And uh, we'd love to connect with you so you can uh, fill that out or you can stop by uh, the information desk in the lobby after the service and we can get you some information there as well. Um, If you are a guest, if you're a regular tender, we talk about three things here repeatedly. And it's this, we are here to help you. We're here to help you experience God. And we hope that you'll do that this morning. And uh, just a little different service that we have planned and excited about that, but a time for to stop and reflect. We'll be celebrating communion in just a little bit. But that's a great invitation and a great opportunity as well to experience God. We want to communi- uh, engage in community, and we also want to excel in mission. And so those are the three things that we're really passionate about. One thing I want to mention, it's coming up next Sunday, and it's a family Sunday. Fifth Sunday, we always have family Sundays. We invite our kids from Faith Mountain to come up and join us in the service. But they'll be enjoying us for the entire morning, and uh, they'll be helping uh, as like junior volunteers. So uh, when you get your bulletin uh, next Sunday, you might be getting it from one of our Faith Mountain kids, or you might be greeted at the door by one of them, and they'll be participating even in the service as we present the service next week. Uh, Pastor Mark will be back and speaking as well, and as I'll be out of town, but it's going to be, I think, just a really fun service. And then we've got something special planned for the service, too, that uh, I don't think you're going to want to miss, and it's a little bit of a uh, panel discussion as, as they talk about some of the issues from the story from the series that we're starting this morning called The Food Sack. Saga, and we'll be talking about that in just a little bit. So, other things that will be going on, you can check out in the bulletin and uh, make sure that uh, you take advantage of those things. But right now, we'll ask the Esthers to come forward. Appreciate all of your faithfulness in giving, and uh, especially through the summer months when people are in and out. I know it takes a little extra effort to remember, but appreciate your efforts in doing that and encourage you to to, uh, worship God in this way. So, let's pray here this morning. Dear Jesus, we do pause and stop and remember that uh, your sacrifice was given for us so that we could experience new life, so we could experience abundant life, so we could experience forgiven life, so we can experience life of hope, and it's all because of you, Jesus. So we pause this morning, we take time out of our week think about you, to worship you, and to thank you. We pray that we would experience you in your presence this morning, experience you in your love and your grace and your redemption. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
like a river flows. This is our prayer. Peace like a river flows. taking our catechism uh, lesson for today and combining it with the Lord's Supper. And we've been talking, well, we started a couple weeks talking about ordinances in the church and ordinances versus sacraments. In ordinance, uh, we believe that is something that Jesus, first of all, commanded us to do, and then secondly, that we saw the early church do, so we can observe it in Scripture. And those are kind of the two qualifications for what we consider an ordinance. And there are two ordinances. One of them is baptism. We've been talking about that the past couple weeks. And then the other one is the Lord's Supper. And we see them both commanded by Jesus, and we see them both practiced by the early church. And it's interesting, the Lord's Supper, we're told that we're supposed to do it. It doesn't tell us how often we're supposed to do it. Some churches do it weekly. Some churches do it monthly. Ours is a, usually every six to eight weeks. And we try to do it often enough to be obedient to what Christ commands, but also not so frequently that we lose track of what the meaning of it is and the importance of it. And so we pause this morning for, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and our question is, what is the Lord's Supper? And the answer is this, Christ commanded all Christians to eat bread and to drink from the cup in symbolic remembrance of his body given for us and his blood shed for us. And so it's a time for us to remember. The Lord's Supper is a celebration of the presence of God in our midst, bringing us into communion with God and with one another as we are all part of the body of Christ. And so a second part of that is that we celebrate the fact that we are all part of Christ's body as believers. And thirdly, it anticipates the day when we will eat and drink with Christ in his kingdom. And so this morning we come to the Lord's Supper to do that, to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. And uh, it's something that we hear so often that I think sometimes we lose the, the uh, gravity of it, the significance of it, the seriousness of it, to really remember what it was that Jesus went through for us, to really remember what Jesus went through for you individually and personally. And so this morning as we come to the table, I want to encourage all of us to take that time to remember, to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But then it's also a time for us to celebrate the fact that we are part of this body, that the people that we sit among, we're all connected to. And we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, so we, we share uh, so much of that life in Christ together. And it's a good reminder of us, our responsibilities to each other, our relationships to each other. Are they what they're supposed to be? Are they what they should be? Are we reaching out and caring for people? Are we keeping um, accounts short where there, where there may be grievances are we dealing with them appropriately? And then just for a, a moment to pause this morning too, to think about the fact that we will all gather again in another place at another time 
and we'll celebrate around the table with the one who made the table what it is, and that's Jesus Christ. And that we can look forward to the day that we will celebrate in the kingdom and we will eat at the table with him. And so I invite you to come this morning to participate in the Lord's Supper. Let me read some scripture and you can follow along here. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we invite you to come this morning, and we'll do this as we typically do. So the outside sections, if you'll come first, and if you will come to the inside aisle and then exit to the outside aisle. And then when the outside sections have finished, the inside section, if you'll start at this side, come across, and you can exit this side. Remember, you can pick up a cup for somebody if that's necessary, if somebody has a hard time walking to the front. And also, there are two cups, and so the bread is in the bottom cup and the juice is in the top cup. But we invite you to come as, as we continue singing. to join me in our prayer this morning, and if you read this aloud with me, and then we'll celebrate communion together. Bread of life, we take the Lord's Supper in reverent obedience. 
We do not want to receive it unworthily, so we come in repentance and faith. Help us to forgive the sins of those who have sinned against us, especially the believers with whom we share the bread and cup. May our partaking of this meal proclaim your saving death and our desperate need of it. Amen. And so, Jesus, we remember. Remember the gift that you gave your sacrifice. The suffering that was all because of our sin. Because you loved us, because you and grace reached out to us. And we are incredibly grateful and mindful this morning. And Jesus, we're also grateful for the fact that you put us in your family with brothers and sisters. And we're reminded as well that we share a life with them, we share a family with them, we share a purpose, a cause, a journey with them. And so we celebrate that this morning. And then, Jesus, we do look forward to your coming kingdom where we will sit with you. We can't wait, really. We anticipate it and we look forward to it and we hope it's soon. But, Jesus, we come as you have commanded to celebrate what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do. And we pray this all in your name. Would you stand with me as we finish singing that song this morning? the hope that we were lost completely without you, Lord. Now we have a hope in the future. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It was back four years ago now, a little bit actually over four years ago, that I started a series, and you may remember this, called... The Curious Journey of Joe Jacobson. And it was a little bit of a takeoff on the life of Joseph from the, the book of Genesis because his name was Joe or Joseph and he was Jacob's son. And we got two weeks into that series, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but it, something happened and it just, we aborted the whole series and kind of uh, just let it slip to the wayside. COVID hit. And uh, that was uh, after the second week of Joseph, we took a nice break from attending church in person, and we shifted to the uh, online attendance, and where I was doing little sermons from my living room with my son, who was my camera operator and editor, and, 
It was actually kind of nice because every time I said something that came out wrong, I'd be like, wait a minute, let's start that one over, Luke. And, and I got to actually go back and, and do sermons that way. Some, there's times on Sunday mornings where I wish I could do that. Uh, could, could we just like back up a second and start over? You know, I, I have those moments. I don't usually get those. But I never went back to the series, and it just went by the wayside. And I'm coming back to it now. But rather than just like assuming that you remember where we left off, I'm just going to start over, if that's okay. And we're going to change it up a little bit from what we did the first time through. Back then, we were in, our, uh, in a totally different type of, of series. And we're calling it the, the uh, food, excuse me, the food sack saga. And I think you'll see why, even as we talk about uh, uh, the story here this morning. But I want to go back and look at this idea of, of Joseph's life and what we can learn from it. And it's a huge story, to be honest. It takes up 13 chapters in the book of uh, Genesis. So roughly um, one-third of the book, he gets, uh, Joseph's story gets more ink than, than any singular story in, in the rest of the book. And uh, there's a lot that's told about it, and we're going to try to condense it down into six weeks. Hopefully, this is a story that's familiar to you, though, because we're going to rush through parts of it. If it's not familiar to you, you can go home and like, you can YouTube like, movies of it, like Prince of Egypt, or, or you can even go find like, uh, Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor Dream Coat, which was a Broadway show, which actually was pretty accurate, believe it or not, although I'm not sure that Pharaoh and, and Elvis had quite the similarities going on that, that you see in the, uh, the musical, if you're familiar with it. But let me just quickly retell the story of, of, of Joseph, and this is going to be really quick, and then we're going to kind of dive into the middle of it, and there's going to be a reason for that that I think you'll see. But Joseph was a guy, he was born, he was one of 12 brothers, he was the favorite of his father, and he also had these dreams about stars uh, bowing down and worshiping him, and she's bowing down and worshiping him. And so he went out and he told his other brothers about this, and they were jealous of him, and they were jealous with how his father treated him, and his father was not very smart and gave him a, a coat of many colors to show that he was favored, and it was just a bad situation. But one day the ten brothers were off, and, and the father, Jacob, sent Joseph to go off and, and, and see how his brothers were doing, and, and as he arrived in his coat of many colors and, and, and very, you know, feeling very, I think, proud of his position and status... They, in their jealousy, decided that they were just going to eliminate him from the picture. And the first thought, well, they threw him in, in, a, in a pit, and there was some debate. Should we just kill him, and, and, or what should we need to do here? And with that, some traitors from the place of, of, uh, uh, came by, and they decided, no, we're going to sell him. And so he was sold as a slave, and he was taken to, to Egypt, and they went back to their father and said, bad news, Dad. Uh, Joseph was evidently attacked by a wild animal. We found his coat of many colors here. See this blood? He didn't survive, and, and we never found him. And that's just how the story goes. Except for Joseph has all kinds of things happening that we hear about. In the brothers and Jacob, there's nothing that we hear about. And that's where we're jumping into the story this morning. And we're going to jump in in um, Genesis chapter 41, I believe. Genesis 42, actually. But this is a fascinating story because like any good story, it has lots of twists and turns and conflicts and complications and there's compelling characters and there's tons of suspense and there's what I would call pivotal moments. And every good story has them. There's these moments where the, I wouldn't even call them plot twists necessarily, but there are times in the plot where the plot changes direction and it's going this way and it moves and it goes this way. And as we go through this, this story, and even as we go through just a little piece of the story this morning, you're going to see that there's these moments where the plot changes direction, these pivotal moments. And so thus the food sack saga, it's in keeping with our table theme, which is all about food. But the food sack is a pivotal moment, and it's going to show up in this story, a food sack in this food sack in the story is such a pivotal moment that it has the potential in it, what's going on there, to change the whole course of history. And whatever happens with this food sack has the potential to change everything, even for us today. And we'll explain that as we go on this morning. 
But pivotal moments, we all live in our own stories, which means that we all have our own pivotal moments. And you can think of some of the pivotal moments of your life probably, as you look back to see where something happened and it changed the direction of your life. You, you met this person, and that person eventually became your, met, or your, your mate. Um, that's a pivotal moment. Or maybe you um, had a teacher in school. Is something that teacher in school inspired you, and you're like, that got you going in a direction that became your career path and trajectory, that was like a pivotal moment. Or sometimes it's a pivotal moment of something that happens in your, in your family, and where you get news sometimes, and it's like, oh, wow. But that news, maybe sometimes for good, sometimes not good, but that becomes a pivotal moment. But we all live with pivotal moments. And sometimes we're very aware of the fact that we're living in a pivotal moment because we're facing a big decision like, you know, should I go to this school or should I move to this place? Or, and we, we have these pivotal moments. And sometimes we're facing pivotal moments we don't even realize it. Because we're facing just a small decision, and it's like, it could go either way, but how that decision is made will set the trajectory of your life. And so, as we dive into the story today, Genesis 42, we want to do that with this idea of pivotal moments in the, in the background, and we're going to bring it to the forefront before we're done. But the question, and I have a, a few questions for us here this morning, but one of the questions I want you to consider is this. Are you facing a pivotal moment right now? If so, what is it? What is the basis that you'll be using to make your decision? But here's a couple other questions I want us to consider it too. This is more general, but as you look at the whole story of Joseph, and if you're familiar with it, and hopefully most of you are, if not, we'll try to get you caught up. But if you're familiar with the story, what do you think is like the central theme of this story? Or what is the main lesson or takeaway that we're supposed to get from this story? So I want you to be thinking about that, and you, you probably have some ideas. Another question I want you to be thinking about, though, is why does this story actually matter for us today? This happened thousands of years ago. In a far-off place, characters that, you know, don't mean anything to us particularly. But why does it mean something to us today? And then here's another question, too, and this one I think is a little more fun. But who are the main players in this story? And I'm going to qualify that a little bit this morning. Who are the main players in this story whose names start with the letter J? And you get three, okay? Main players in the story whose names start with the letter J. Well, okay, if you're thinking, you probably got the first one. Joseph. How many got it? Very good, all right. Second one you probably got, and that was... Jacob. How many got Jacob? Good. All right. Anybody struggling with the third J? Or you got it all figured out? Okay, we're going to see as we go on here. Let's read. Verse, uh, chapter 42, verse number 1. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. It's not really how it starts, but that's really what's going on here, okay? So as this story has been told, and Moses is the one who's writing these book, uh, this book and telling the story, but he's been talking about what happened to Joseph and how he's now in Egypt and how he's raising up, uh, has risen up through the ranks in Egypt. But he goes to the story here, and he says, back at the ranch, Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, and he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there's grain in Egypt, so go down there and buy some food for us so we may live and not die. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So there's a lot to unpack here in just these first four verses. What's going on here is Joseph has gone down to Egypt and has done very well. Jacob and his 11 other sons stay in Canaan, and right now they're not doing so well because there's a huge famine in the land. And there's no food here in Canaan, but there is food in Egypt, and that's because of Joseph and, and a lot of the story that we haven't told. But Jacob says, you know what? If there's food there and we're starving here, I'm going to send you down to get some food. Now, he says some things in that, uh, that, that are interesting. First of all, let me just say this. He had 12 sons, and he's talking to 10 of them here, and we'll get to this in just a minute. But that's a lot of sons for a guy to have. Well, he actually had 12 sons by four different women. 
And, uh, and they were all living with each other at, at the same time. And so this was just a very chaotic family to start with and not a healthy situation. But making things worse is the fact that there's this famine going on. And Jacob wants to send his, his sons to go buy food so that they may, and I'm quoting verse 2 here, may live and not die. Now this is a question. Is, this, is he just being um, melodramatic here? Like, you know, we're really hungry, you better go buy food or, or else we're going to die, guys. I think so. I don't think he's being melodramatic. I think he's actually talking truth here. I think they're in a horrible uh, situation here, and they've got to figure out what they're going to do about food. He hears about this food and says, let's go. We've we got to figure this out, guys. But I don't think we realize how important that verse is to the story and how important that verse actually is to the big story of Scripture. Because that family would become the, the, the foundation of the Jewish nation. The 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Jacob. If this family doesn't make it through this famine, the book of Genesis basically comes to an end and the Bible's done. And so we have a huge situation going on here, or what we might call a pivotal moment and we, a lot of times, read that story, read right past a verse like that, when, and Jacob is saying, hey, wait, time out here. We have a horrible situation going on here. We have got to get this figured out. So he sends 10 of his sons to Egypt. Two do not go. One doesn't go because we already know he's in Egypt. That's Joseph. And the other one doesn't get sent either. That's Benjamin. And that is his youngest son. So why doesn't his youngest son get sent? Well, it's because it's, we're told this, what we just read, it's because his father was afraid for him. Which are like, okay, if this is just a little kid, you can see like a, a journey to a foreign country could be scary. He's not a little kid. At this time in the story, Benjamin's probably 30-ish. So you would think he would be able to handle himself, except for the fact in Jacob's mind, there was this time 22 years before when he sent Joseph off to see his brothers, and Joseph didn't come back. And I think Jacob has all this time for 22 years wondered if he really got told a true story by his other 10 sons. Lots of suspicion there. And you kind of read into this like, uh, you know what? I sent you know, my favorite son with those 10 guys, and he didn't come back. And, you know, you're really my second favorite son now, Benjamin, and really you've replaced my first one because he's gone now. And I don't think I'm going to put you in that same situation because I don't think it will be safe for you. So 22 years have passed between Joseph being sold as a slave and his brothers now going down to Egypt to buy food. And so, they arrive down in Egypt, and they stand before the governor, as we're told, the person who would distribute the food, and they are going to try to buy some food, and I'm imagining that this is kind of an unnerving situation, like, they don't know these people, they're foreigners, they probably don't even speak the language. Uh, they're probably uh, very apprehensive here. And they come and they stand before the governor who walks out and it's Joseph. And he sees his brothers, 10 of his brothers standing there that he hasn't seen in 22 years. And can you imagine what's going through his mind? Like stunned to start with. But maybe there was some anger. Maybe there was that moment of like, oh, well, check this out. You know, what goes around comes around, guys. And, and, uh, and maybe was, there was that, even that thought that passed through his mind, like, like, you know, maybe we could get some vengeance here. Maybe We wouldn't even call it vengeance, would we? We could just call it justice. But I'm now in the place where I can execute justice for what you did for me. Years ago, you made me a slave. I, I could make you guys slaves. And Joseph is standing there, and you're thinking of all these thoughts that are running through his mind. And he's looking at these different brothers. And he's maybe reliving that situation when he was sold to slaves. And, and maybe he's even hearing that voice that says, Well, I got an idea, guys. Let's just sell them. 
And maybe he can hear that, and as he hears that in his mind, he's looking out there and he's seeing the brother who said that. What an incredible moment in the story. So what does Joseph do? Here's what he does. He decides to keep his identity hidden. His brothers didn't recognize him. They had no idea. So he keeps his identity hidden. Then he accuses them of being spies, which they deny. In fact, we can read that, verse number 10. He says, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We're all sons of one man. We're honest. We're not spies, which maybe Joseph had to stifle a laugh right then. He said, no, you've come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with their father, and one is no more. Now, that's just a curious statement to me. It's like, why did they say that there were 12 of them? Why didn't they just say, yeah, we're brothers, there's 10 of us? But they introduce the fact that there's another brother still alive and another brother who's gone. And so we don't really know what possesses them to say that, but Joseph's going to, he already has that information, but he's going to take that and use it against them. Then he, what does he do? He, he takes these 10 guys and he puts them in the prison and tells them that they can only get out on one condition. They can go back to Canaan and they can get that one person, can cut out of prison. He can go back to Canaan. He can get that younger brother and bring him back. That we know is Benjamin. And he lets them sit there for three days. And this is their response. Verse number 21, they said one to another, surely we are being punished because of our brother that we sold off 22 years ago. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. And now we are experiencing the exact same thing. We are pleading for our lives and he's not listening. Interesting, isn't it? And they assume that they're being judged for something that they did 22 years before that they've been carrying around all this time. But maybe, just maybe, they're showing a little bit of regret and they're showing a little bit of remorse. And maybe they're showing a little bit of like, that was, we never should have done that. And verse number 22 goes on, there's 23 rather. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. And we have a really interesting dynamic then is that they're saying this, boy, you know, this is because of what we did to Joseph. And Joseph is actually listening into that conversation. And it's got to be affecting him, don't you think? Well, as the story goes, Joseph changes his mind a little bit. He brings him out of prison and says, you know what, here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to leave one of you in prison. And he selects Simeon, one of the brothers, and says, the rest of you can go home, but you got to get your younger brother and bring him back, and that's how you're going to get this brother out of prison. And so he sends them back, and they don't know this either. As he sends them back, he sends them with food, but he takes all the money that they had given him to buy food, and he puts it all back in their bags. They have no idea. It's in their food sacks. They get back to Canaan. They open up their food sacks and say, oh, gosh. All of our money's here, so now it looks like we're thieves, and so now we're kind of like fugitives. Boy, this really shuts the door. I mean, we've been accused of spies. We've been accused of this. Like, there's no way we're ever going back here. We're going to have to figure out something else for food. But when they get back there, they have another problem, and that's there's only nine of them instead of ten of them. And so they have to stand before Jacob and say, "Uh, yeah, sorry, Dad, but Simeon's back in prison. And you can't think that that goes over well. In fact, Jacob is probably like, and that's why I didn't send Benjamin with you, right? But as it goes on, they get hungry. And so they have to, you know, do something about that hunger. Verse number 38, their father, Jacob, said to them, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. Now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. are, Are you guys kidding me? You want to take Benjamin back so you can get more food? And he says in verse 38, my son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he is the only one left. Now, there's an insult. Jacob was was really bad at this parenting thing. And so he's like, you know, you 10 guys don't count. It's just this one that counts. If harm comes to him on the journey that you're taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrows. And so they go back. First or chapter 43 tells us the story. The famine was still severe in the lands. So when they had eaten all the grain they had brought from Egypt, their father said, go back, buy us a little more food. But Judah said to him, the man warned us solemnly, you will not see my face again 
unless your brother is with you. Okay, let me read that verse again. But Judah said to him, okay, there's our third J in the story, okay? Judah, anybody get Judah as the third J in the story? Good for you, okay? Because it's going to be really important. So Judah is speaking now here. If you will, verse number four, if you will send your brother along with us, or he's speaking for, for Joseph, if you will send your brother along with us, we will go down and buy food for you. But if you will not send him, we will not go down, because the man said to us, you're not going to see my face again unless your brother's with you. So Jacob asked, why do you bring this trouble on me by telling the man that you had another brother? Like, you guys are really dumb. You didn't have to tell him that we had another guy at home here. But they go on. The man questioned us closely about ourselves, our family. Is your father still living? He asked us. Do you have another brother? We just answer, answered his questions. How were we to know that he would say, bring your brother down here? So then Judah, our third Jay, said to his father, send the boy along with me. We will go at once so that we and you and our children may live and not die. We're back to that same theme. I myself will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, I will bear the blame for you all my life. As it is, if we had not been delayed, we could have gone down there two more times and bought food. But Judah is stepping up in the story. And so as it goes on, Jacob relents. He sends these nine brothers along with Benjamin. They go back down to Egypt. This time, they're treated a little bit differently. Instead of being put in a prison, they are actually invited to have lunch with the governor himself. But then it gets a little freaky because they're all brought in. They still don't realize it's Joseph. And they're, they are given assigned seats at the table. And they are given assigned seats by their chronological age. Well, they're... They have four different mothers. Some of these brothers were born like almost at the same time as as each other. And these guys are in their 40s, maybe 50s by now. And they're sitting at this table and they realize that they've been seated by their age. And it kind of freaks them out, as it should. Well, and then, not only that, as they're eating, um, Benjamin, they just keep bringing him more and more food. And like the brothers are eating fine, but Benjamin, I mean, they're just piling stuff up. And it's like reminiscent of like, oh, this guy somehow knows that this is the favorite child too. And so they have these kind of freaky moments going on. But eventually, the uh, governor, Joseph, says, here's, here's your food. He puts it all in the sacks, put, puts their money back in the sacks, and sends them home. Except he had done one other thing. In one of those sacks, he had put his official cup. And he had put that cup in Benjamin's sack. And so verse, uh, chapter 44, we read, Verse number three, as morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to a steward, go after them. When you catch up with them, say to them, why have you repaid good for evil? Isn't this the cup my master drinks from and also uses for divination? This is a wicked thing you have done. And so when he caught up with them, he repeated these words to them, but they said, why are you saying such a thing? We wouldn't do anything like that. I mean, we even brought back the, the money we found the first time in our sacks. We brought it back. We're not going to steal it again. In fact, if any of our servants are found to have it, he will die. And the rest of us will become the Lord's slaves. So very well, he says, the steward, may it be as you said, and say, bring him back. And each of them, in verse number 11, lowered their sack to the ground and opened it. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest, ending with the youngest, And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And they tore their clothes, and they all loaded up their donkeys, and they returned to the city, and they went in before Joseph, and they bow on the ground and said, all of us, all of us, all of us will be your slaves. Just let him go. But what had happened here is Joseph had just set them up big time, and he had set them up big time with a food sack, and that's why we're calling it a pivotal moment. Because what Joseph has done here is he has recreated the same scenario that he had experienced 22 years before. He has put his brother at the mercy of his other brothers. And they can sell him up the river. They can say, oh, Benjamin, sorry, dude. You probably shouldn't have taken his his cup there. And they can go back to their father, and they can say, here's what happened. And they can even tell the truth this time about what happens. And just to, just to emphasize it a little bit, what had he done? He had set Benjamin in that room and just kept bringing him more food and more food and more food. And really making the point like, hey, you know, we got another favorite child here. 
And so he totally sets them up so that they can replay exactly what they did 22 years ago. Pivotal moment. So what'd they do? Well, let's look at what happens. Verse number 18. Judah went up to Joseph and said, Pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak a word to you, my Lord. Do not be angry, your servant, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself. And Pharaoh speaks up our third J. So since he's such a key part in the story, let's pause here for a second and look at why he's such a key part. Here's what we know about Judah, okay? Judah had spoken up before in Joseph's story. It was way back in chapter 37, verses 26 and 27, when Judah had said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. And the brothers agreed. He was the one who came up with the idea to sell Joseph to the traders and into slavery. And some scholars think that he was trying to save Joseph's life. I'm more inclined to think to see that he was just kind of the leader of the pack here and the strongest personality and said, hey, here's a fun idea. Let's sell him as a slave. This is Judah, okay? Same Judah. Judah had other problems too. If you go to Genesis chapter 38, we hear it looks like a parenthetical story, but Judah is involved in a horrible situation and where he actually ends up in bed with his son's widow, and she gets pregnant, and it's just, I mean, if this story sounds bad, it was bad. And Judah has been totally involved in that story too. So he's been not just the one who sold his brother into slavery, Judah's the one who had been unrighteous, untruthful, and immoral with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. So this is not like a guy that you know, we have a lot of warm, fuzzy feelings about. But then there's another thing here in this story, though, that's remarkable. And it's this. Judah is really the selected son, not Joseph. And I'm using that term selected. There's probably a better term there. But Judah is not, Joseph is not, Judah is not the, necessarily the primary character in this story. And that sounds weird to us, because obviously he is, right? But Judah has been selected for something that Joseph has not been selected for. And if you're tracking maybe a little bit ahead of me, what has he been selected for? Well, he is going to be the one that, that result, receives the top blessing from Jacob when he dies. And so he is the fourth-born son, actually, but he's going to surpass Reuben and Simeon and Levi. And as the fourth-born son, he's going to receive the primary blessing. But what was part of that blessing? Part of that blessing was that the Messiah would come from the line of and the tribe of Judah. Let me read Genesis 49. This is what Jacob says right before his death. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus here. Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Until he to whom it belongs shall come, Jesus and the obedience of nations shall be his. Judas is the, not Judas, Judah is the one chosen to be the ancestor of Christ. So this story is actually as much about Judah as it is about Joseph, because his line is where Jesus comes from. We use that phrase, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so that leaves me lost and confused as I look at this story. Because over here I see Joseph, and I can identify with Joseph. I mean, he's a good guy. And I mean, he's gone through some rough times. He's, he's, he's been mistreated by his brothers. He's been falsely accused. He's spent time in prison for something he didn't do. He, I mean, he's at it, but he's still overcome it. And, and I look at, at, at him, and I'm like, yeah, that's the hero of the story. And yet... I look at Judah, who's, a, who's really like a dirtbag. 
You know, like he's getting, you know, all of this, you know, privilege, if you want to call it that. Why is that? Why is it Judah that's getting it and not Joseph? And here's the simple answer that doesn't totally work, but it works. It's because of the grace of God. See, our tendency is to relate to Joseph in the story and to identify with Joseph in the story. But what we need to do is we need to relate to Judah in the story and to realize that we are the Judah that God comes looking for. Because we're the Judah who has failures in our past. Because we're the Judah who's done things that we don't want anybody else to know about. Because we're the Judah that's been all about ourselves. Because we're the Judah who's betrayed other people. Because, yeah, that's that's who we are. And we don't like to think of ourselves that way. It's much easier to to relate to, to Joseph, isn't it? But God sees it differently. And God goes with Judah, and God goes with us because we're the ones who need grace, and we are the ones who get the second chance. And this is the beauty of this food sack saga. It's that God gives us all second chances, and it's that God offers grace to us, and God takes our messed up stories and still does something with them. But here's what I think is exciting, too, is the fact that Judah was not the same person at the end of the story that he was at the beginning of the story. Where before he betrayed Joseph, what did he do with Benjamin? He protected him. Where what he did in the past affected other people negatively and he didn't care about him. Now what is he doing? He's begging for Benjamin's life for the sake of of Jacob, his father, where in the past he led his brothers to do wrong. Now he's leading his brothers to do the right thing. I asked at the beginning, what is the theme of this story of Joseph? Probably the obvious one that you think of is, well, God's sovereignty and God's providence. I think the theme of the story of Joseph is really God's grace and redemption. And all through this story, you see God come in grace and redeem. He actually comes in grace to Jacob and redeems him. We'll talk about that a little bit more next week. Actually, that's true for Joseph, too. The Joseph we see at the end of the story is not the Joseph we see at the beginning of the story, but it's true for Judah as well, is God comes in grace and he redeems. So God comes in grace and chooses, but he comes in grace and redeems and changes, and that's the story that we can relate to and identify is that God chooses us and then he changes us. And how does he change us? It's lots of factors here, but one of the things that God uses to change us is pivotal moments. Pivotal moments. And as we look at Judah's life, so we're stepping aside from Joseph, and if we look at Judah's life, we can see some of the pivotal moments that God used, I think, to change him. The first pivotal moment that's obvious is that moment with Joseph, where Joseph is in the pit and he says, let's sell him. And it was a pivotal moment of failure. But that pivotal moment shaped him. Because it revealed him to himself for what he was, and he lived with that guilt and that shame, and he walked with it for 22 years. But you can see how that pivotal moment was like, who are you really, Judah? We can go on there. There's another pivotal moment, and it comes with Tamar, his daughter-in-law, and again, a huge failure. But this failure rebuked him, but it also challenged him. And you sense here in his response, and we didn't look at that story. You can go back and read it, Genesis 38. You sense in that story, Judah's like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't who I want to be. And it starts to, and it becomes a moment where the, I believe, where the trajectory of Judah's life changes. We see another pivotal moment, and it's with Benjamin in a food sack, where Benjamin gets framed, the cup is in his sack, and Judah says, oh, you know what? I'll take his place. Pivotal moment. That just revealed him, though. The change had already taken place. Judah, 
who was selling one brother is protecting the other brother because of God's grace in changing him. And so let me just wrap this up with a couple of summary thoughts here. First of all, it's this. God offers grace to each of us, and none of us is beyond his grace. No matter our failures, no matter our past, no matter what we've done, no matter who we are. God never looks at and says, no, nope, that's too far. No, God comes in grace and says, okay, this is what I got. And we're all in need of God's grace, and we can all celebrate we've done that this morning with communion. God offers grace to each of us. Secondly, former failures may be a part of our story, but God is in the business of redeeming stories. And no matter where your story is this morning, this might be your pivotal moment where you're like, okay, it needs to be different. And by God's grace, it will be different. And by God's redemption, it will be different. But God takes our stories and it will give our stories to him. He's like, I can work with this. And you know what I love about Judah? By the way, you know, we, we call them the Jews. That's because of Judah. So his family becomes the, the prominent family in, in the whole, in the whole uh, history of Israel. But, but God comes to Judah, and, and he's not young anymore by the time we get to this part of the story. But even, I don't know if he's an old man, but even as he's gotten older, he still has that potential for change. Thirdly, each of us is asked to play a different part in God's story. Joseph had a huge part to play. In fact, what was Joseph's part? His part was to go off to Egypt and to go through all of that so that he could keep the other 11 brothers alive and so that the story of Israel could continue. Judah had a totally different story. He would give birth to a son. By the way, that son was born to that daughter-in-law, Tamar, that's in the line of Christ. But we all have different parts of the story to play, and they're all important. And the last thing is this. We will face pivotal moments, moments of decision that will affect the trajectories of our life. And that's really what makes it a pivotal moment. It's not just that some circumstance has turned on you. It's that that circumstance has turned, and it's left you with a decision and a choice. And maybe that's where you are right now here this morning. You're left with a choice. Maybe it's a choice on what path you will take. Maybe it's a choice on how you're going to handle the path that's been handed to you. The choice that's been made for you. But you have that pivotal moment. So here's what we got. Pivotal moments are opportunities, though, for us to see ourselves for who we are and what we are. And as you face a pivotal moment... Use it in your life, whatever that is, to say, okay, who am I? What am I? And you might not like what you see, but that's okay because we have a God who's a God of grace and a God who redeems. But we use pivotal moments to see ourselves for who and what we are. Secondly, pivotal moments then become opportunities for us to choose a different path. And maybe that's where you are this morning. It's time to take a different path. And sometimes... Sometimes God, I think, is good and gracious to us because he brings other pivotal moments to us where we're not choosing a new path. What we're just realizing is who God has changed us to be. And where Judah maybe, I don't know if he had any self-awareness of this or not to see the irony of the fact that he had been the brother who had sold Joseph to be the brother who was saving Benjamin. But that's what God wants to do with our pivotal moments. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the story of Joseph. But we also thank you for the story of Judah. We want to relate to Joseph, but we really are more like Judah because we have these things that are part of our story that you come in grace and forgive and cover and change. And then, God, you redeem us in our stories and you make it all different. So I have questions for us this morning as we sit with our heads bowed and eyes closed and reflect on God's word this morning. The first question is this, have have you ever experienced God's grace? You've accepted his offer of forgiveness and salvation through Jesus Christ and invited him to forgive you and to come into your life. 
where you have, in a conversation, personal conversation between you and God, confessed your sin and your failure and asked him to forgive you to come into your life. That's the first step in that change we talk about. If you've never taken that step, you can do that where we sit this morning. Secondly, though, if you've experienced that grace, I guess the question comes to you this morning, what is the pivotal moment that you're facing right now? And I haven't really identified any of those. But maybe you can identify something. Or maybe you can even look back in your past and see a pivotal moment. But what is the decision that you need to make today? Because that's how stories get redeemed. Is when God brings us to these moments and says, okay, you can make the right choice here. You can do the right thing. It doesn't matter what your past is. You can do the right thing. And what is it? What is that decision that you need to make this morning? Will you make it? And so, God, we commit ourselves to you as we start this series and we look at the life of Joseph. And yet we see there's a bigger story at play, too. It's a story that we are part of. I pray that you would apply these truths to our lives, and you ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? This afternoon, actually. I just wanted to say this. We're going back to the story just briefly. As we left it, Judah is pleading for mercy for his brother Benjamin. But let's just pretend like we don't know what happens, okay? So come back as we continue the saga of the food sack. You're dismissed. Have a great week.